One method of attack in Super Mario Bros. 2 is pulling a vegetable from the ground and throwing it to hit an enemy. Mario and friends aren't just limited to harvesting veggies to use as a weapon, they can even pick up and throw other enemies to do the job. Each playable character has their own traits when it comes to gameplay, and one of these characteristics is how fast each character can pick up an item. Toad has the fastest pickup speed amongst the four, and it is easy to bulldoze your way through the levels thanks to this skill. Perhaps many of you have managed to discover an amusing bug that occurs when you throw two enemies back to back in a short period of time. They collide and shoot straight up into the sky rather than bounce and fall off the screen. It's so out of the ordinary, it's hard to miss if you manage to achieve it. Why does this happen? Let's find out. My approach was to select several values from RAM that are tied to the enemies and monitor them at the time the glitch occurs. Because there are so many values and at least two enemies involved with the glitch, I wrote a script so I could see the values in decimal format inside an overlay. The numbers from left to right are as follows. ID is a value that represents enemy type. 1 is Red Shy Guy, 3 is Pink Shy Guy, and 2 is Tweeter, as it is called. To the right of that are three values for the x-axis, position and velocity consisting of direction, r for right, l for left, and speed. You can see that our enemies have a constant horizontal speed of 8. To the right of those three is another set of three, this time for the y-axis. The tweeter is the only enemy moving up and down. There are more values than just these six related to horizontal and vertical positioning, but these will do. After that, we have three timer values, t1 to t3. Various objects and enemies require timers for certain things, and these bytes help keep track of those timer values. There are other timers that have been omitted from this list. As an example, throwing an egg at Birdo causes T3 to run a timer for the flashing cycle for graphics. The timer is only tied to the graphics, as freezing the value in RAM after a hit will hold Birdo's graphics cycle on the same frame, but still allow Birdo to move and attack as usual. Throwing an enemy puts timer T1 to use, and it counts up toward 32. T1 helps identify an object as a projectile when it is not set to zero. See how these two shy guys coexist peacefully in the same area? If I set the timer to a value between 1 and 32, let's say 8, and freeze it, the shy guy doesn't bump into the column in reverse direction properly. When the other shy guy enters the hitbox area, it was as if the one with the frozen timer was thrown the enemies collide. So why use a timer that counts up to 32? Why not just use a flag to indicate the enemy is a projectile? The timer allows the thrown enemy to get clear of the player before reinstating collision detection with the player. In fact, if I temporarily disable a T1 counter check in the code, watch what happens when I throw this shy guy. Yeah, collision, immediately. So we need a timer as part of the throw process. The last column of information in the overlay box is the status of the enemy. Is it invisible, visible and therefore alive, or is it dead? So if we throw one enemy into another, the following things happen. The enemy is thrown and the timer T1 starts counting upward toward 32. The enemy is now a projectile and collision with the player is temporarily disabled. The thrown enemy connects with another enemy. At this point, the thrown enemy's horizontal velocity of 48 is halved to 24, and the victim enemy gets the same velocity. Upward velocity is also set to 32 for both. That helps give them that bounce and fall animation, as gravity can take it from here. The timer of the thrown enemy is no longer incremented. Both enemies have their status set to 2, so they are considered dead. They leave the screen and their status is set to 0. Sequence complete. So with some background information on what happens under the hood when one enemy is thrown into another enemy, what is going on when this oddity takes place? Let's check the numbers. It looks like both timers freeze and the upward velocity is continually reset to 30. At a glance it seems like the enemy hit start bounce sequence logic is stuck in a loop. Both enemies keep having their upward velocity set to 30. Can we break the loop by simply editing RAM? That would be faster at this point than starting to search for code. It also helps isolate where the problem is likely occurring. Since both enemies have a T1 timer value, both are likely still considered thrown enemies by the game. Let's see what happens when I zero out one of the timers in RAM. Hey, intended behavior kicks in. We've broken out of our glitch by simply clearing a timer. 
Let's reload the collision and this time alter the X position of one of the enemies so they no longer overlap. Ah, this also corrected the glitch. So it seems like the problem happens due to some code in collision detection logic that probably has something to do with the T1 timer. The big question is, where in the code does this happen? It took a while, but the good news is, I found it. I'll show you the real code a bit later. For now, let's look at a pseudocode mockup as it makes it easier to explain what is happening. During the setup phase for collision detection of the current enemy being checked, there is code that says, if the enemy isn't active, just skip ahead and check the next enemy. That makes sense. No reason to check the current enemy for a collision against any other enemies or objects if it is already dead or not on screen. Just above this is code that checks timer T1. If it has a value other than zero, it skips over the alive and active check. So if the enemy is thrown and not active, you still want to proceed with collision detection? And this is where my speculation really started to run wild, because there has to be a reason for this, and it causes a bit of brain pain. Under what circumstances would you want to check a dead or invisible enemy for collision? This is assuming I have these status values correct in the first place, and 0, 1, or 2 don't mean multiple things. If you throw one enemy into another, both get marked dead. It is possible to hit multiple enemies in one throw. So you might think, well, you still need collision logic to make sure the dead thrown enemy registers a hit with the second enemy it hits. But then, wouldn't that situation take care of itself when the second enemy gets its own turn to check for collisions? It seems like this code is a bit extraneous, like the logic is overthinking the possibilities. But wait, there's more. Above this code is a section that first checks to see if the current object being tested for collision is either a Birdo egg or a Pokey enemy. If so, then you definitely want to perform that enemy alive check, otherwise bypass it. So the thrown object timer is irrelevant when it comes to these two things, but is relevant for anything else. Assuming I have provided all the information needed, what are the special cases surrounding these two objects, and why does a thrown enemy need to have the alive check ignored? Let's think outside the cartridge and check other versions. USA Revision 0, USA Revision 1, Europe, and Super Mario USA all exhibit the bug. Super Mario Bros. 2 is an adaptation of Doki Doki Panic from the Famicom Disk System. Does Mario 2's origin game have the bug? It does not. So this, er, uh, feature was added when the game was tweaked to create the international release of Super Mario Bros. 2. No more pseudocode. Let's compare the actual code for these two games side by side. Doki on the left, Mario 2 on the right. Mario 2 added the code to skip the status check if timer T1 is running for the current enemy. Was this a bug fix for Doki Doki Panic that created a new bug unintentionally? Were there any enemy or object changes in behavior made in Mario 2 that required this special case to be added to the game? Those of you intimately familiar with both games can share your thoughts. This bug has a story, and the story doesn't end here. That's right, it's Super Nintendo time. Super Mario All-Stars is a 16-bit redress of the NES and Famicom's 8-bit Super Mario Bros. games. Super Mario Bros. 2 is included, and it does not have the bug. The big question is, how? How does it not have the bug? Both the NES and Super NES CPUs are based off the 6502 instruction set. That makes it pretty easy to port logic from an NES game to a Super NES game. So you figure that the same code for game logic was used in the Super Nintendo release. As a matter of fact, there are a few odd design decisions about the Super Nintendo that make it look like the system was indeed meant to be a Super NES and perhaps even offer backward compatibility with NES cartridges, but oh boy is that ever a separate video. NES Super Mario Bros. 2 Revision 1 code on the left, Super NES All-Stars code on the right. Couple of things you may notice when examining code between these two systems. 
Number one, some op codes, such as branching and jumping, might be different. Number two, the NES uses 16-bit addressing, and the Super Nintendo uses 24-bit addressing. Other than that, especially in the case of our example, the code is pretty much identical. Even the addresses in RAM are the same. As a matter of fact, I copied and pasted my script from one emulator to another, and it picked up and interpreted all of the values just fine, since they were all in the same RAM location. The elephant in the room here doesn't have to do with syntax, but rather with design. The suspect code that was added to Doki Doki Panic to form Super Mario Bros. 2 is present in All Stars. However, the bug does not exist. This suggests that A, this code added for Mario 2 should be here in the first place after all, and B, the problem it created was fixed elsewhere, likely later on in collision detection in the code for All Stars. And here it is. Just before the collision handling subroutine assigns damage, sets velocity, etc. to the victim enemy, the Super Nintendo release of Mario 2 checks that enemy's status to see if it's dead. If so, it skips that damage and velocity logic, the very thing that causes problems in the NES version. This skip code is definitely new code, it was not present in the NES release, and this fixes the airmail bug. All Stars elected to let collision detection run as usual and add code to skip initializing values for the enemy hit by the thrown enemy. They basically patched it at the 11th hour of hit detection for the current frame. This is certainly a bug fix much closer to the offending code. We end up with multiple status checks in different places in the same sequence of code. Not great for maintenance purposes, but it gets the job done. Interesting thing about this new code. We can use a Game Genie to ignore this death check by telling it to just call the damage subroutine no matter what. Basically revert the logic to the NES version. The result? The glitch now appears in All Stars. So we now have a way to fix the problem in the game for the NES, or add it to the game on the SNES. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please like the video, comment, and share it with your friends. I also have a Patreon available, and until next time, thanks for watching.